Processes that are almost inevitable will have happened here, but a long time ago, back in the Devonian. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about the Devonian. I'll actually talk about uh, really young things, but project it back to the Devonian because that's when things happen here. And 
the things that I'm going to talk about, a lot of those, probably all of them, did happen here in the Devonian. And they will have affected and contributed to these mineral deposits. So to start off, that one there, so that one, and what I've done here, or what has been done here, is really not Gondwana land to give us some kind of context for where we are. We're in the Lachlan origin, which was a collisional origin, and it was smeared onto the outside of Gondwana land. There was another one, the Delamerian here, that's the, the next one uh, towards the west. And after the Lachlan, there was a whole series of them. There was the New England one, there was the, the, the Gimpy, we, you call it Gimpy here, we call it Brook Street in New Zealand. They've all got gold and uh, various other things as well, porphyry coffins, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then uh, further out, uh, we've got uh, the one that I live on, which is the Otago Schist. So that each one is progressively younger. Each one is a collisional mountain belt, and uh, each one had a lot of these processes that I'm going to be talking about. So there's two things we need to worry about, and the two overall themes uh, through the talk. The first is what happened when parts of the Lachlan first got put together. Because at one stage, this pile of slates and sandstones and things that, that you call home, that was a pile of dirt on the sea floor at one stage. So that got piled up in a collisional origin that you know and love. That's the first stage. And then the second stage is when these other ones came in on the outside and somehow reactivated it. So we've got, first of all, piling up a big heap of dirt. <coughs> and secondly, once that's made into rocks, hitting it again from the outside and stirring it up again. So there's two different processes there. And I'm going to start off by talking about the processes initially that go on when you pile up a pile of dirt. And when I was told to come and give these talks, whoops, got the wrong one here, look at that. I was told to show some pictures, and those pretty pictures to keep people in the pain. So I'll start with the Himalaya. And the, the interesting thing about the Himalaya, first of all, big mountains, so this is the biggest collisional origin on Earth. It's active at the moment. And it's what, what, what we would call orthogonal convergence. The direction of convergence is right angles to the mountains. So it's the green arrow there. India is cr crashing into Asia and <coughs> giving rise to big mountains. And I'll talk about the wind direction quite a lot because wind direction is sort of significant. The monsoon wind blows in much the same direction as the tectonic arrow there, it blows from the south, and it reaches the mountains and it drops all its rain. And because it rains a lot along the, the edge of the mountains, you get a lot of erosion, and because you get a lot of erosion, you're going to get lots of uplift. If you didn't have the erosion, then the rock gets in the way and you can't have the uplift. It gets all complicated. So, the Himalaya is asymmetrical in that it's steep on the southern side and relatively gentle on the northern side. There's rapid uplift on the southern side and relatively slow uplift on the northern side. There's been a lot of uplift. It's been going for about 30 million years. And so there's quite high grade rocks. As a general rule of thumb, places like where we live, or you live, yeah, and where I live, Greenshift Fasces is where the money is. Those rocks are gone from here. There's just been too, too much uplift and erosion over 30 million years. But nevertheless, I want to persist with the Himalaya because it tells us about processes that go on in collisional mountain belts, even though there's uh, no actual gold there or copper. There we go. 
what we do get, and all each one of those yellow blobs is a hot spring. It's inevitable when we have these processes going on with lots of rain and lots of uplift that we get uh, hot rocks being uplifted close towards the surface. I'm going to focus on the ends. We've got Nanga Parbat, which is eight kilometres high at the western end, western box, and Nantubara, which is almost eight kilometres high in the, the eastern box. They are the most active parts, probably the most active uplift zones on Earth, the most dramatic ones. And what do we get? Very high relief. Right down here it's about 2,000 metres above sea level and up there it's almost 8,000 metres above sea level and they're not very far apart. Very, very steep. This is the steepest gorge on Earth and the river, the sand po, is cutting down the uplifting rocks like a hot knife through bark. Very large river, cutting down as the rocks go up. And because the rocks are going up so quickly, and the dirt has been taken away, we have uh, rocks being uplifted faster than they can cool. So right up in the core of that massif, we have very hot rocks. And it's that that drives the hydrothermal system. You don't need igneous processes to drive the hydrothermal system. All you need is rainfall, erosion, uplift, and the whole thing will, will be driven. This is going to the other end. It's very similar. Uh, uh, the Nanga Parbat end. Standing here, uh, the person in the foreground there is standing looking <coughs> at the view uh, at about 3,000 uh, metres above sea level, looking at eye level to where the igneous intrusions are. Now the igneous intrusions are trivial. They are there because the rocks are hot. The igneous intrusions are not making the rock hot. The rocks were hot and allowed the igneous intrusions to come in. But still, we're looking at uh, granitic intrusions at eye level, in under the mountains, but still at, at eye level. And the, the rock under Nanga Parbat there is so hot at such shallow levels that we have what's called dry steam. Most of the uh, orogenic systems, the orogenic gold systems, that you deal with hot water. This is fluid pressure versus temperature. We deal with hot water in that green dashed circle. If you get into uh, shallow level igneous processes, you head towards the boiling line, this is epi epithermal systems and maybe uh, into porphyry coppers. But there's only two or three places on Earth that are so hot at shallow levels that we get dry steam. Basically, it's like pouring you know, rainwater onto a hot plate. And it just goes sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. That's essentially what's happening here. In this case, it's not moving metals around, but I'm using the example to show that we have very, very high temperatures, very shallow levels, as a direct result of erosion and uplift. That's not supposed to work. There we go. So now I want to go to Taiwan and our tour around Asia, Pacific region and spend a bit of time on Taiwan because it's the youngest, most active uh, uh, collisional belt that is sort of analogous to the one that we're sitting on here. So Taiwan is just a pile of dirt. It's a pile of yesterday's dirt. The age of the sediments that make up Taiwan is much the same as that pile of dirt in the Bogan River Valley and the Macquarie River Valley that I drove over from Dubbo today. It's Miocene, I think, isn't it? So that's what Taiwan is made of. It's a slate belt, especially in the middle, at the top there we've got <coughs> a slate belt, which looks very similar to the one that you live on here, except it's somewhat younger. And we've got the interesting situation that because it's so young, 
We've got everything happening together. It's all being squeezed together. We're generating hydrocarbons from uh, marine organic material in the Miocene and younger sediments in the fold thrust belt. <coughs> We've got orogenic gold being generated in the Miocene sediments that have turned into the slates. And at the very far northern end, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit more later, but uh, we've got uh, epithermal gold and possibly porphyry copper style uh, at a bit deeper, where uh, with the, uh, uh, there's a back arc zone uh, intruding onto uh, the northern end of, of Taiwan. But I want to focus on the main island of Taiwan because that, that is a slate belt that is a modern analogue for what you live on here. It won't be exact, but it's along those lines. The yellow dots are orogenic gold deposits and they're small, they're trivial. When they erode, they make uh, economic classes on the beaches. That's about as far as it can go. But at, at depth, almost certainly these processes that are going on in there that I'm going to talk about, those processes are making much larger deposits. All right, so the next question is where did the wind come from? Well, the wind comes from the south, parallel to the island, and as a result, the erosion on both sides of the island is much the same. The rainfall on both sides of the island, much the same. So the mountain belt is symmetrical. The Himalaya I showed before was asymmetrical. It was steep on one side, gentle on the other. Taiwan is symmetrical and it rains quite a lot. And as a result, both sides of the island look like this. That's a, a, a cyclone up there. That's, that's how they get their uh, rain, the serious <coughs> rain. And uh, I just want to draw your attention to this number here, uh, 2,000 millimetres in one day. When was the last time you had rain? Last week. Last week, and how much did you get? Pretty bad. 50 mil? 7 mil. Oh, no, not that much. Two or three. Oh, I was going to be optimistic. I'm enjoying that. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> Just think about what two metres of rain looks like. An absolute flood. There we go. For, for an Australian audience, I have to tell you what erosion looks like. All right, this is erosion. <laughs> This is Taiwan. In, all right, this is erosion. This is what drives mountain belts. This sort of thing. Quite dramatic. Boom. Too far. There we go. And with all of that rain, that rain makes its way into the rocks and it percolates down and it hits heats up and it comes back up, like I was talking about for the Himalaya. And every one of those red dots is a hot spring, most of which are boiling. So these are hydrothermal systems with rainwater, meteoric water, over the whole island, interacting with the rock, and no igneous processes. And as I said before, the, the yellow dots, there's, there's some gold there. Not a lot, but some gold there. This, this is a uh, flood damaged hot spring resort. They have these resorts up on the mountains and they're in the bottom of these sluice valleys. And every time the typhoon comes along, it washes part of the towns away. And then they just rebuild it. Quite spectacular, actually. So this is what the dirt looks like. This is the stuff, the equivalent of what I was driving over today from Dubbo. It's just mudstones and sandstones. This is the stuff that you live on now, except that yours is Devonian. You get up into the mountains and it starts to look a lot more like the stuff that you live on. These are proper slates. They got a cleavage and, and that sort of thing. You can see this is bedding and, and the cleavage is going up there and you, you've got folds around here that look a bit tighter than that but again this is the dirt the same age as the Bogan Valley 
and then you get right up into the slate belt and it becomes proper schist. And this is the host for uh, most of the gold deposits. Some of the, the, the goldy material was in slightly lower grade than this, but this is green schist basins, a proper green schist basins schist. And these are metamorphic veins going through. And the foliation is close to see. I'm not sure you've got rocks that young around here, have you? Have you got close to see rocks? You must, you must have a little veneer of dirt somewhere around here that, that, that's that young. Yeah, that's right. All right, so we're going to a model. This is a numerical model. And when you're piling up dirt, like I'm talking about, not all of the dirt comes together at the same rate. And this is just a numerical model that takes some dirt, brings it together, <coughs> and erodes it on one side. So this is a, an asymmetrical model. It doesn't matter that it's asymmetrical, but here it's asymmetrical, and on the left-hand side, there's quite a lot of erosion, which allows a, a lot of rapid movement of dirt. And so we have differential uplift velocities, rates, differential uplift rates. Some parts are going up faster than the other. And because of that differential, you get extension within the mountains. And this is an estimate of the extension as a, just as a result of the velocity differentials. And I'm looking at this oblique one here. The, the red zone, reds and oranges, there's a zone of extension. Even though it's compressional origin, there's a zone of extension right in the middle of the mountains. Now that's a model, and uh, some of you probably model uh, war blocks or something like that, and you know how much truth there is in those. <laughs> anyway, what we're doing here is going out and measuring it. This is GPS changes over 10 years, so you, you can, using satellite navigation, you can actually measure the tectonic changes within the mountain belt. And the blue zone here, right along the mountains, is extensional. The pink stuff is compressional, the blue zone is extensional. So there's two implications for that extension in the middle of the mountains. One is that in the place where you're getting most of the rainfall, you're also opening the rock up, and that lets that water in, and that's why it's so easy for that water to get down into the rock and heat up, and then come back up again. High permeability in these fracture systems. It's just a great big pile of fractured rock. It's fractured slate belt, so it's got a cleavage and so forth, but it's got fractures all through it. And that water just pours down 2,000 metres in a day. Not all going to go down the, the, the tube inside, some of it runs up in the valleys obviously and not much buildings over. But some of it goes down into the rock. So that's one of the implications of this extension. <coughs> the other one is because it's a dynamic system, you've got rocks moving, and here's the rock trajectory, the black arrow, moving that way. So rocks can move from a pink zone to a blue zone. And this is really common to find in orogenic deposits around the world, slate belts, whatever. You've got folds, and that's what these are, is kink folds. And then the fold axial surface opens up, and you get quartz veins going along them. So this is one way that you can get extension imposed on compressional structures without changing the far field tectonics or anything, all you're doing is moving one rock from one place to another within the same tectonic setting. It goes from compression to extension. And of course it can go from uh, extension to compression and you would get a completely different set setting. You would get veins that were folded. Work. There we go. So this is just to put it uh, 
at the outcrop scale, the, the red lines are the gold bearing veins <coughs> uh, within the system there, and those gold bearing veins are filling extensional uh, conjugate sets of extensional fractures, and each one of those, that conjugate set is conjugate kink folds. So they're in the foliatural surface of these conjugate kink folds. This is a direct result of moving rocks from compression to extension. All right, so now we're going to a bigger picture. This is a cross section uh, right through the island of Taiwan. And uh, it's geophysical, uh, magnetotelluric, and basically what it's doing is showing where the resistive rocks are at depth and where the conductive rocks, electrical resistivity, electri electrical conductivity. So the reds and oranges and yellows are conductive, and that means some kind of connection, probably via water, and not just pure water, it has to have something dissolved in it to conduct electricity. And we look at the scale, we're going right down through the crust. So it's, it's quite a big scale. But what this is showing us is that we can pick out, and this is one of the few places in the world where you can actually see hot waters at depth under an active origin. I'll show you another one later. But there are very few places where you can actually see the water. And this is geophysical imaging of that water. And it's brine. We got this is the dirt, the Miocene dirt, that's generating hydrocarbons, and it's got seawater in the pore spaces. So of course it's very conductive. And as you get into the main business part of the origin, you've still got some brines, but you're starting to get other things imposed on it, and almost certainly over in here, which is the main part of the slate belt, you're generating water from clays, dehydration of clays, crackers, and so forth. You could call that metamorphic water if you want. Plus you've got uh, the uh, meteoric water coming down from above, and that tends to dilute those brines. So in this fault zone here, in the main part of the slate belt, we've got uh, brines that have been diluted and they are less conductive. But this is telling us something about how the fluids are dispersed through the rocks. And to put it in a context that's relevant to you, these brines, in this case, may be directly relevant in that you need brines to move base metals, copper, lead, zinc. If you, if you just have these dilute fluids as you have over here or along that fault zone, you don't expect to be able to move base metals. But if you've got brines, high chloride content dissolves the base metals and you can move them around. So we don't see any evidence of base metal mobility up at the surface here yet. Wait another million years or so and it may have come through the system. But the prediction is that down here somewhere, as part of this slate belt, we're moving base metals, but only where the brines are preserved. When you're dealing with metamorphic, meteoric water system, you're unlikely to move copper, lead, and zinc. And I'll come back to that side of it later in the talk. Well, I've been talking about this bit here, the main part of Taiwan, where there's no magmatism, and all we've got is compression, uplift, and hot rocks. But the Okinawa trough is opening up. It's a, a back arc setting. It's, migra it's extensional, and it's migrating into Taiwan. And that's where they get their, their uh, epithermal system with base metals. And that is the so-called uh, gold plus sort of uh, hydrothermal system at the very northern end, which has been mined, uh, it, it doesn't <coughs> mined it anymore, compared to the orogenic system, the so-called gold only. 
systems that you find further south. And as the Okinawa trough opens up, the gold plus style of mineralization is going to migrate further and further down the island and be superimposed on the orogenic gold that was there beforehand. So here we've got a superimposition that's already started and it's going to uh, migrate with time uh, down towards the south. Alright, so that's Taiwan, which I don't just want to leave Taiwan now, but I want to leave with you the concept that if you want to find anywhere else that looks like Kobar, then I suggest that Taiwan is a good place to start looking. You'd have to look underneath Taiwan to find mineral deposits, but if you want a concept of how things happen, then uh, Taiwan's pretty good. I want to go now to New Zealand, which of course I know a little bit about because I live there, and this is the way it is now. I had a picture before of New Zealand smeared on the outside of uh, Gondwana. This is after Cretaceous, this is a photograph taken after Cretaceous uh, extension of the uh, Tasman Sea rifting off New Zealand. Little bits of Lachlan over there uh, with one mine, one origin gold mine. And if that, that's the northeastern one. The point here is that New Zealand is made up of a lump of those origins, several of those origins. So the processes that are going on now, we have a new plate boundary going right through the middle here. The processes that are going on associated with that are superimposed on old crust old crust that has been reworked. And this is sort of an analogue, it's not a good analogue, but it's a sort of an analogue for what, what must have happened in the Lachlan when, for example, the New England origin got plastered towards the east in the Permian, in the late Paleozoic. I use Taiwan as an example of piling up the Lachlan and New England coming on to here is sort of similar to reactivating this crust here, this old Mesozoic or older crust here with the present plate boundary. So this is a reactivation concept now rather than the initial piling up of dirt. <coughs> there we go. This is what it looks like a bit closer and it, it's very, very similar to Taiwan as it turns out. There's epithermal systems with uh, base metals. There's, there's porphyry style underneath the epithermal system uh, up, up at the north end. And what I want to talk a bit more about is the orogenic systems down here, the, the so-called gold-only systems that occur in the South Island. We've got subduction there, we've got subduction there, and it's mainly striped slippage or oblique convergence. It's oblique compressional origin in the Southern Alps here, right along uh, the main mountains of the South Island. And we've got, again, like Taiwan, very small gold deposits that are being formed as we speak. So these are active ones. Well, the first question you should be asking now is where did the wind come from? The wind comes from the west, and the uh, South Island is located right across that wind direction, and so, of course, it rains on the west, it's dry on the east, and the origin is asymmetrical. The mountains are on the western side. This is what it looks like. Lots of erosion. I haven't got a, a video because they didn't take any videos, but... Lots of rainfall on the